Is my lining okay? You look beautiful. Okay, thank you.
Good evening. My name is Gil Bland. I'm the president and CEO of the Urban League of Hampton Roads. And it is a pleasure to, uh, to join uh, in this important discussion with you tonight. I'm also the immediate past chair of the Virginia African American Advisory Board. And uh, in particular, I have some experience in the healthcare industry. I am the founding member of a national organization called Black Directors uh, Health Equity Agenda. So um, I will also share some personal experiences. Tonight, our purpose is to discuss the impact of COVID-19 vaccine. We want to uh, dispel and have a discussion about myths versus facts. Before we start, uh, I am hopeful that everyone will, will join with me and acknowledge our gratitude to our sponsors and panelists tonight, in particular, the Riverside Health System. Riverside has been a strong leader in building healthier communities for over 100 years. Additionally, we have Eflin Gibson of Hampton University and Gaylene Connoyton of Celebrate Healthcare. Gaylene is also a board member of the Urban League of Hampton Roads. To address the issues of tonight, uh, let's, let's be honest and, and have some candid discussion. We all are aware of some of the unfortunate and wrong historical issues in the healthcare system. Uh, there has been any number of wrong historical practices, just to be candid. Um, but those bad practices are history, and history is just that. Uh, I think we can uh, all agree, and particularly because of what one of the reasons what we're doing tonight is that those bad practices have been reduced considerably. And there are a number of people, including Riverside, Hampton University, the Urban League, who are attempting to address the issues of health equity for everyone. This history has unfortunately uh, resulted in uh, low-income communities, particularly minority communities, to having a distrust and a fear of the healthcare system. We saw it a year ago with COVID testing, uh, any number of, uh, of underserved communities were hesitant to be tested for COVID, which resulted in, in more than uh, necessary uh, people contacting the virus. Uh, secondly, uh, in, and more importantly, as it relates to tonight, it has resulted in a very disproportionate impact of minority communities, underserved communities, and low-income communities not being vaccinated. Uh, we have to change that. Uh, the efforts uh, have resulted in, in an epidemic of, of outstanding impact. For example, in the United States, 442.5 million people have, um, have had COVID. 680,000 plus people have died from COVID. Worldwide, the numbers are staggering. 219 million cases, and 4.6 million people have died. Uh, unfortunately, I'm here tonight as a, as a victim of COVID. I personally am one of those cases. Uh, in January of this year, I was diagnosed with COVID. And for over two months, I was hospitalized. During that time, there was also uh, a time when social distancing was imposed in the healthcare system. So I was unable to see my family. Uh, during my two month stay in the hospital, which uh, just exacerbated the problems. I was in the ICU for weeks. I had double pneumonia and I was totally dependent on, on medical providers for any type of assistance. It was a very uh, stressful situation and one I would want all of you to avoid. Frankly, um, and it's difficult to say this, but I almost died. And I share this tonight for but one reason. The COVID virus is real. It's killing folks daily. And some of the deaths are unnecessary. If only we were to adhere to medical advice and some of the opportunities and tools that are available to us, in particular, the vaccinations. COVID will render you helpless. It can take your life. And as I said, I have but one reason to share this. I want all of you to be safe. I want all of you to be well. 
I don't want any of you to have to experience what I experienced. It is a life and death situation and one where you are just completely helpless. Um, so with that said, I'd like to um, start this program with some real discussion from uh, our various leaders and panelists. And I would uh, open the door to our panelists to begin the discussion tonight. Thank you. I will remain online and, and, and attempt to answer any questions at the end of this period and share my story in greater detail. But it's a painful one and one that I want you to avoid. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Gaylene Knoyton. I am the president of Celebrate Healthcare and as Gil said, I'm on the board of the Urban League of Hampton Roads. And I am honored to moderate this very important forum tonight. You know, we are about 19 months into this um, pandemic. Who would have thought we would have been this long, this far along? And uh, if you look at your dinner, around the dinner table, we have people missing from around the dinner table. My mother is one of them. She died of COVID last year. And so they have all these myths out here that people, I got a chip in my shoulder. I mean, I got a chip. They're going to be able to follow me. I want to be infernal. This form, myths versus facts, will answer all of, uh, or dispel all of these misnomers that's out here. And we want you to be able to have the facts so that you can go out to your, into the community and tell your neighbors and your family members why it's important to take this vaccine and, and know the real facts on what's going on. I'm excited that we have a great panel uh, tonight and I'm gonna introduce our panel to you. We have Cindy Williams. She is the vice president of pharmacy for Riverside Health System. We have Toya Sosa. Sosa. She is the chief um, diversity, equity, and inclusion officer for Riverside Health System. And you met Gil Bland, who's the CEO of the Urban League of Hampton Roads. And we also have Dr. Ethelyn Gibson. She's an associate professor at Hampton University School of Nursing. And she also is the director for the Center for Gerontology and Minority Aging at Hampton University. And so we're just going to jump right in because there's a wealth of information. So pull out your notebooks, get an ink pen, because you want to write down the real facts. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy Williams, and she's going to provide you with her presentation. Great. Thank you, Gaylene. And, and thanks, everybody, for attending this afternoon. Um, it's been great to, uh, to have an opportunity to, uh, to spend time with Gaylene and many of the vaccine clinics in the community. Um, so I'm going to just send a note because, Andy, I cannot see the slides. Um, so hopefully you can rectify that so I can go ahead and I can move forward with the presentation. Okay, there we go. So the discussion this evening is going to be uh, myths versus facts. And um, we're going to talk about uh, the actual um, information around COVID within the community. And I, I always like to start talking about what is going on locally, because I think we hear a lot um, at the national level. And, and I think that's great. But I think when it comes down to it, it's really important what's happening in our backyard because every community is different. And this is what, uh, and, and so tonight, I hope that I can share that with you. So I'll get Andy to go to the next slide. Our goals for today, is I'm gonna provide some information on COVID-19 in Virginia. We'll then uh, talk some about COVID vaccines to help you make an informed decision about vaccination. Every clinic that I go to, I always let individuals know, I'm not here to tell you about that you need to get vaccinated. I'm here to give you information so you can make a good decision about your health status and about uh, moving forward with vaccination. And then at the end, we are gonna have an opportunity to have questions from the, the group uh, for the panel. So next slide, please. We've already introduced our panelists for this evening. And so we will go to the next slide. So Gil has given his story. So let me get right into COVID-19 in Virginia. 
So I want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing from the current surge uh, due to the Delta variant. Um, I know many of you have heard about the Delta. You've also probably heard about Alpha and Beta and Lambda and Wild. And so what happens with, uh, with, with, that, with uh, viruses is that over time, it's very natural for them to mutate. And since the beginning of COVID, in order for us to think about these in more common terms versus the actual genetic names, they've named the variants. And they typically don't name them until they become a variant of interest or a variant of concern. And so a lot of what we're seeing right now in the US and specifically in Virginia is due to the Delta variant. And this was initially seen in India earlier this year. And effective this summer, it became the most common strain of COVID, not only in the United States, but in Virginia. And why this is important is that Delta is just a lot easier to spread than what we saw with the previous variants that we had had in our area. But one thing I do wanna make sure, and you'll hear me say this several times through the presentation, the vaccines that are available today are continuing to show very good effectiveness against serious illness, hospitalization, and death once you've received the full series, and the full series would consider to be two doses of Pfizer and Moderna, or right now one dose of Johnson & Johnson. We also know that when we increase vaccination rates in our community, it slows the development and the spread of variants. Next slide, please. So this is just a depiction of why the Delta variant is much more concerning for us and why we're seeing such a surge late this summer that really is almost as bad as what we had earlier in the year in, in January when we had many people unvaccinated. And it's because with the original strain of COVID, we one person typically would infect two other people. But with Delta, that's gone from one to five. So what we're seeing is that when somebody gets sick with Delta, and especially early on when maybe they don't have symptoms, they're spreading it much more rapidly in the community. And that's really what's resulting in all of the hospitalizations that we're current, seeing currently. Next slide, please. So I, again, as I said earlier, I really wanna bring it home to what's happening in our community. So this is information that I downloaded earlier this week from the Virginia Department of Health website. And it shows COVID-19 cases in Eastern Virginia. And you can see where we are in this August surge, and we're not quite where we were at the end of, of January, but what makes this surge so much worse is that in January, we didn't have vaccinated individuals. And so what we're seeing now is, is primarily those that are unvaccinated are really driving this current surge. And when we look at what's happening within our hospitals, and I can speak specifically for Riverside, is most of the people that we're seeing in our hospitals today are individuals that are not vaccinated. And it tends to be younger individuals because if we go to the next slide, I've done a breakout uh, and I, I did not get every area of Hampton Roads. I just couldn't get all of the information on the slide, but I picked some of the larger areas that I believe represent the, the, the attendees tonight. And so what you can see is that when we look at cases by age group, it's really starting to shift down. And in each of these communities, you can see where the largest age group impacted by COVID since the beginning is now in that 20 to 30 range with the 30 to 40 coming in right behind it. And the reason for that is Many of our older individuals took advantage of the vaccine early on because we know that it was initially offered to those in the older population. And because of that, we're not seeing as many of them get sick. For the purpose of tonight, I also included the, the breakdown in cases by race and ethnicity because as Gil so eloquently put earlier today, you know, there's been a, 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 um, a hesitancy, I think, uh, in some um, and some ethnic groups uh, because of mistrust of healthcare. And one of our goals tonight is to really dispel those myths and to answer your questions. So next slide, please. You know, I think it's really important to understand that vaccines are not, you know, the end all, but they are one of the best defenses we have right now 
for COVID. But we also know that even with vaccination, and we'll talk a little bit about breakthrough cases in a couple of minutes, there are other things that we still need to do. We still need to make sure when appropriate that we're wearing masks, that we're practicing social distancing, that we're washing our hands. And those are things that actually protect you. But we also need to make sure that we're doing the other things such as isolating if we have symptoms because we, at the end of the day, wanna also protect those that we love. Next slide, please. So when you start thinking about COVID-19 vaccines, there's really two things that, that we wanna think about. One is, do we need them? And that's really the public health side of things. And the other thing is, do they work? And when we think about, do they work? It's about the benefits and the harm, um, you know, and, 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 and really weighing those side effects versus the benefit that we get from them. So I know based on the numbers that Gil talked about earlier, um, it's clear that with this current pandemic and, and the slide that I showed you about where we are with cases in Eastern Virginia, I don't think that there's any argument that we need them. So let's focus now on, do they work? Next slide, please. So again, gonna reiterate, the COVID-19 vaccine is still proving to be highly effective against serious illness, hospitalization, and death. And we know from the get-go that it was never expected that the COVID-19 vaccine would be 100% effective. No vaccine is actually 100% effective. And so when you think about the typical flu vaccine that many of us have taken every year for years, it's usually about 50 to 60% effective. When we started down the path of developing the COVID-19 vaccines, it was the FDA said they would only approve a vaccine if it was at least 50% effective. And right out of the gate, the vaccines were much more effective with that. But over time, you know, as time goes on from when you got the vaccine, me personally, I got my second dose more than eight months ago. And so over time, we see a little bit of waning of that effectiveness. And with the Delta variant, we're seeing that to be a little bit of more of a, an opponent uh, than maybe we had with the previous one. So we, we are seeing some breakthrough cases, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but they do tend to be less severe than those cases we're seeing in unvaccinated individuals. Next slide, please. So, so this is a slide that talks about the rate of infections, and this is for the state of Virginia. It's for the whole state, not just for Hampton Roads. And so what this demonstrates, and this is how I know that vaccines are working. And so to orient you to the slide, and this goes all the way back to February, the dark blue line, which is on the bottom, is what we're seeing for COVID, COVID infection in those that are fully vaccinated. So fully vaccinated again, two doses of Pfizer or Moderna, one dose of Johnson & Johnson. And you can see that the COVID rate is staying pretty low. The medium blue line or the middle line are those that are partially vaccinated. And what we're seeing, especially with Delta, is that you really need to have that second dose. And then the yellow line are the unvaccinated. And I think if you look from July, when you know Virginia hit the low in, in COVID cases in probably the middle of June. But what's happened since then are really a couple of things. At the end of May, we relaxed a lot of the, 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 the restrictions that had been put in place around indoor dining and sizes of groups and, and all of those things because this was gonna be our summer of freedom. We're gonna get back to normal. Well, about that time, Delta became the primary variant in the US and in the state of Virginia. And so we can see from July 1, which really happened, you can see the widening of the difference between active COVID cases between those that are vaccinated and those that aren't. And it's about eight times more likely that you will get COVID if you're unvaccinated than if, than if you are vaccinated, fully vaccinated. So this is one of the things that tells me that the vaccines are working and, and specifically against serious illness, hospitalization and death. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the breakthrough cases. So you may hear about those. So what is a breakthrough case? A breakthrough case is considered when you get COVID-19, even if you're fully vaccinated. But again, the ones that we're seeing are typically mild, 
but I will say they can be a little more serious if you're older or have other health issues. And so again, I've got another statistic from Virginia. This is through the 11th of this month. And you can see how low a rate those that are fully vaccinated have of developing COVID, being hospitalized and dying. Next slide, please. So let's just talk a couple of minutes about the, uh, the COVID vaccine, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gibson to talk about myths and facts. So we do have one fully approved vaccine by the FDA, that's the, COVID, uh, that's the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Um, it is still under emergency use authorization for those adolescents for a third dose for immunocompromised and for boosters. And then Moderna and Johnson & Johnson are also approved, but still under emergency use authorization. So we know a lot about the vaccines and we know that actually they're quite safe. And as I showed earlier, they're showing good effectiveness. But what we're still learning, we don't really know how long these are gonna last. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about boosters in a second. And we also don't know as new variants come about are, th are the vaccines gonna continue to work? And that's just something that we're gonna learn over time. But what we do know is getting more of the population vaccinated helps to stop these new variants. Next slide, please. So let's talk about boosters because that's actually how I've spent the last uh, probably three of five, the last five days is, is listening to hours of discussion about boosters with, from the FDA and the CDC. So the FDA on Friday had a meeting and finally announced late yesterday that they are a, approving a booster dose for Pfizer vaccine for those age 65 and older, those under 65 at higher risk of severe COVID disease, and those with occupations that place them at a greater risk of COVID-19 disease. Right now, this is just for Pfizer because they're the only ones at this point that have put the full information, but the FDA now does have information on Moderna and they expect information on, on Johnson & Johnson shortly. So we think we'll hear news about those two vaccines in the next few weeks. This booster for Pfizer, you're eligible six months after the second dose, and there'll be much more information coming out about the booster doses um, over the coming days since the CDC just finished their meeting today. Next slide, please. So I'll finish up my comments now that we, you know, we know they're effective and, and the way we know that is because we're seeing the difference in how people are being infected and, and getting COVID vaccinated versus not vaccinated, but are they safe? I will say due to the number of people worldwide that have gotten this vaccine over a reasonably short period of time, the first vaccines were administered starting December 15th. So we're not even a year into it and hundreds of millions of doses you know, have been administered of each of these vaccines worldwide. So we know that they overall are very safe and you know, there's common side effects and it's similar to other vaccines. And, you know, I'm over 50 and I've gotten the shingles vaccine and I will tell you the side effects I had from shingles much worse than what I've gotten from the COVID vaccine. That being said, there's no medication on the market that doesn't have some very rare side effects. And so I've listed some of those on the slide here. Every vaccine does have a fact sheet that has full information. And so if you've not been vaccinated to this point and you're, you're moving forward with vaccination, please review the fact sheet and then ask your healthcare provider any questions. So with that, I'm gonna ask to go to the next slide and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Eflin Gibson to spend a little bit of time talking about facts versus myths. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, let's see, I think are my slides caught up with yours? Um, I see, are they safe on my screen? Yep, you need to go one more slide. One forward. more slide. Yep. There we go. Okay, so we have in front of me um, the myths versus the facts. And I, I just wanna spend a few minutes just reminding people, if you want to be sure before you head out to get a vaccine, you need to make sure that you talk to a trusted messenger. And who is that trusted messenger? It should not be social media. 
It should not be somebody in the barber shop and the beauty shop. It should not be your cousin who is in California or Ohio. It should not be Pookie. It should be somebody who knows about the medication. And that is somebody who is on the screen tonight. That is why we are here. I'm gonna say it again. That is why as a registered nurse, as Cindy Williams is here as a farm D, that is why Riverside Health System, Bon Secours, Centera Health System, trusted medical providers are the ones that we need you to trust with this information. Now we know that there's been a lot of history. There has been, but now we are about saving lives. And you heard the first messenger that came on the screen, Mr. Gil Bland, talked about how he does not want you to spend time in the hospital like he did. And then I'm gonna give you the message that I am in the hospital as a healthcare provider, as a nurse, every single week taking care of patients. They are young, they are old, but they are always somebody's son, they are somebody's daughter, they're somebody's grandmother, somebody's grandfather. And I do not want anybody to ever cry over them when I have to tell them that they have left this earth, when it was something as simple as a shot that could have saved their life. So that is why I'm here tonight to dispel what's true and what's not true. So let's talk about what's untrue on one side of the screen and what's true on the other. So number one, it is not too soon to know that these vaccines, did they make them too quick? No, they did not make them too quick. Everything we went through, all of the clinical trials, and we've said this over and over again, people have said, well, didn't it, didn't we need 10, 15 years? No. And when you come to get your vaccine, we will give you the fact sheets. But if you have been listening, 10 years ago, when we had H1N1, Ebola, and maybe for some of you who are a little bit younger, you might not remember all of those diseases. So I will give you that. But we did not miss a step with any of the clinical phases or any of the clinical trials, but we will give you the fact sheets to help you understand that so that you will know. Number two, we always get asked this. If I have already had COVID, don't I have enough circulating antibodies? And so I probably don't need to take the vaccine again. And so you're probably thinking, I'm probably not gonna get COVID again. You will get COVID once and you can get COVID twice and you can get COVID a third time. Did you hear me? So you do still need to get a vaccine. Look at the next myth. I do not need to wear a mask after getting the vaccine. That's what we talk about when we talk about a breakthrough infection. So yes, you do need to wear a mask and you still need to get a vaccine. Look at the other myth. The vaccine can cause infertility. You see there on the fact side that again, we have done um, many um, trials and we've um, also ruled that out. You also have seen um, in the news very recently that many women in their third trimester, when they also then receive the vaccine, they pass on those antibodies um, to their baby as their baby is being born. So that is actually 
a good thing for their newborn baby. Look at the next thing. The vaccine gives you COVID-19. With the mRNA vaccines, there is no live that there's no live virus in those vaccines. That is not true. And then the very last one there, mRNA technology is new and changes your DNA. Probably going in with some of the things that we eat probably changes more of your DNA than the vaccine would. But again, the facts are there on the side. That is not true. Next slide. I put this slide here because people always ask me, why should I take a vaccine? Because I'm worried about what it's gonna do to my body. I think that everybody who has probably been through school, I'm thinking has taken one of these vaccines to go to school. I just want you to lay eyes on these 14 vaccines that if you had not had these vaccines, they would have never let you through the school door and they probably would have never let you go to anyone's job. Just think about it. Tetanus, rubella, measles, chickenpox, mumps, whooping cough. Just let it digest. And I think that we took all these vaccines and we kept it moving. Next slide. So tonight, we wanted to bring you the facts. And the last thing that I wanna leave you with, because again, this is about education. So I know that everybody on this screen probably has a cell phone. So I want you to take out your cell phone and I want you to take your cell phone and I want you to go to the website because we talked about it, vdh.virginia.gov backslash coronavirus. I'm gonna say it again, because this is about, edu this is about education. So it is vdh.virginia.gov backslash coronavirus. And if you go over to the left-hand side and you scroll up, and you go to the side that says, get the facts. And over there, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. At any point in time, you can go over to that side. And if you need to find a place, um, a COVID-19 testing site, you can click there, put in your zip code, you can find a testing site. You can put in your zip code and you can find a vaccination site. And then if you scroll down a little bit more and go down to get the facts, and it says situation summary. And if you want to know what is a Delta variant all about, you can click on where it says situation summary, and it's going to break it down for you and explain what a Delta variant is about. You don't have to believe us. The facts are right there. So tonight, we're here to tell you about the facts and we want you to believe the facts, not the myths, but that's what we're here about tonight. So hopefully we've broken it down for you, but we're here for you in this community and that's what we wanted to do tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mom. <laughs> Dr. Gibson got Dr. Mom when we have our vaccine <laughs> because she will tell if you if you talk to Dr. Gibson, you will get a vaccine. Trust me. She's very convincing. That's why we call her Dr. Mom. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gibson, and, and thank you, Cindy Williams, as well. That was some really good information. Um, I also want to roll right into the questions now. So if you have a question, start asking your questions. The first question we have is. Why should a young person perfectly healthy with no comorbidities feel compelled to take this relatively 
uh, untested vaccine. Cindy, you want to take that? Yeah, I'll start and I'm sure uh, Dr. Gibson will want to join in. But um, so first of all, what I would say, let's let's start with the untested piece of that and then we'll come back and we'll talk about why it's important for everybody to consider getting vaccinated. First on the untested piece, as Dr. Gibson said, when these vaccines came to market, um, they actually have, were tested equally to other vaccines that have been um, before them. So the number of the number of individuals that these vaccines were tested in were equivalent to what the flu vaccine. It was actually more individuals in these tests than were in other vaccines like a shingle. So these have actually been well tested, even though it was on an accelerated path because of the urgency of COVID. And I would argue because of the large number of people worldwide that have now received these vaccines, that they're actually some of the best tested medications that we've ever had in the history of, of medications. But now let's go to the fact that you're a younger individual. You know, we're seeing young people get sick. We had a young person in one of our hospitals die week before last that was 31 years old. So we know that just because you're young doesn't mean you can't get COVID and doesn't mean that you can't get serious illness from COVID. But let's step outside of yourself for, for a minute. So say you are young and you get COVID and maybe it doesn't make you so sick you have to go to the hospital. What about the young, the young child in your household that doesn't have an opportunity to get vaccinated that you may pass this on to? What about the grandmother that maybe lives in your household? What about another family member who has cancer? So I think we need to think about ourselves because obviously it's very important because none of us wants to be, as, as Gil had said earlier, none of us wants to be in the hospital, in the ICU, critically ill, not knowing if we're gonna live. But I think we also don't want to, at least me personally, and I've got 88 year old parents, the last thing that I would wanna do is inadvertently make them sick and have them have the negative outcome. So I think those are the reasons that I would give you that you need to consider getting vaccinated for your own health, but also for the health of, of your family. Thank you. Dr. Gibson, did you wanna add anything to it or did Cindy do a good job answering all? <laughs> answering? Um, the, the only other thing I would add is that for that young person, um, I, I wanna add information regarding um, what we call long haulers disease. Um, we don't know um, what might be the other implications for other um, body system um, involvement for that young person. Um, again, how that might affect um, their lungs in the long term, or especially for young women, how that might affect um, their own cardiovascular system. So we are concerned about that for them also. Great, thank you. The next question we have is, if I had two Moderna shots, does any booster that I take or do it, does it need to be a Moderna booster? And that is a, an excellent question. Um, so um, today, what is being approved just because that's how it's been studied is if you get, for example, two Pfizer doses, you need to get Pfizer. If you get two Moderna, you need to get Moderna. That being said, there are several studies going on in the United States right now that we hope to have information from in the next few weeks, which do look at if you got Moderna, does it make sense to get Pfizer, for example, for your next dose? Or if you got Johnson & Johnson, does it make sense to get Moderna for your next dose? So I, I, I believe the scientists feel like that is going to be a good way for us to move forward. The problem is we just don't have enough information today to confirm that, but stay tuned because I do think within the next month or so there will be information. But for now, the recommendation is going to be to get that booster dose of being the same vaccine as you got for your first two. Great. Thank you. What data do you have for how the vaccine affects fertility in men and women? Dr. Gibson, you want to take that one? Um, right now, the information um, that we do have, um, and again, it was presented um, on our slide, is that um, it is not affecting um, women's fertility um, at this point. And so that is why we are um, 
uh, encouraging uh, women um, to be vaccinated. Um, most women um, are encouraged to be um, vaccinated um, if they are not currently um, pregnant. And then if women um, are pregnant, most of their physicians are encouraging them um, to be vaccinated in their third trimester, um, because again, um, then that immunity is then um, transferred um, to their fetus um, upon delivery. And, and I'll just add one thing to that. Um, the, the CDC in their meetings yesterday actually spent a lot of time in the afternoon talking about COVID, COVID vaccines and pregnancy. And, you know, through multiple studies and following people over time, they know that a number of individuals that have gotten COVID-19 have gone on, COVID-19 vaccine have gone on to become pregnant. And so they're looking at numbers and incidences and they're not seeing anything again that would indicate that there is a, any type of impact on fertility, the ability to get pregnant, the ability to carry the baby to term. They're looking at all of those things and will continue to evaluate it. But based on the information presented yesterday, there is no impact that they have seen on fertility or the ability to carry the baby to term. Great, thank you. I read um, on several news articles about how some of the babies are being born with COVID or the mother delivered the baby and die after she, after she delivers the baby. And it's from legitimate sites, and it's just not any site, these are legitimate sites where you read these articles and, uh, and, and news, newspapers as well, the legitimate ones. And it, was, and it was heartbreaking to see that. The next question, what is the risk of hospitalization for a healthy young person with no comorbidities versus a vaccinated person who has comorbidities? I think that is a, a really good question and I'm not sure I'll be able to give you a full scientific answer. Um, I can only tell you what we're seeing from our experience. The majority of individuals that we are seeing with breakthrough cases that end up sick enough to be in the hospital are older, most of them got their vaccines at least six months ago, and they tend to have uh, pretty serious health issues. I'll give you an example, one of the individuals we had in recently was 69, was um, significantly overweight, um, 50, they were, their BMI was 50, and of course, I think we all know that anything over 25 is considered overweight, so they were significantly overweight. They had heart disease, they had kidney failure, and they had diabetes. So that's the picture of the individuals that we're seeing that are um, getting breakthrough cases ending up in the hospital. On the other hand, you know, we're seeing younger individuals without underlying health conditions uh, end up in the hospital. And, and that's not saying that everybody will. And as, as Dr. Gibson said earlier, it's not only about being sick enough to get in the hospital. There are people that get COVID that may never be sick enough to be in the hospital, but have other long-term effects. And I think some of the effects, we don't even know what they're going to be over the long-term. And so, as she mentioned, long, long haul COVID or, you know, long COVID, um, you know, we're seeing people that are having ongoing memory issues. We're seeing people that are having ongoing respiratory issues or cardiac issues. And so, even if you don't end up in the hospital, we're seeing significant health issues from those or a chance of significant health issues from those that are, that are getting COVID. So, you know, all I can say is what we're seeing locally is, you know, the, the individuals that are in our hospitals tend to be unvaccinated and tend to be younger by at least 15 years from what we saw back in January. Great, thank you. Dr. Gibson, how and why does a vaccine protect longer than natural immunity? And I wanna add one piece to that. If a person had COVID, do they, are they, do they need to take a vaccine? Are they naturally um, immune to the COVID now? Um, the, the vaccine um, protects much longer um, because those antibodies, um, you know, natural immunity, wanes after time. So just like when I received my vaccine in January, okay, think about this. And then I received my second boost um, 21 days later. And now that 
would begin to wane after eight months. Remember that? And so now we're saying, well, do I need another boost right after eight months? So if I had had, if I had been infected with COVID, right? And after about 90 days, that would start to wane. 90 days. 90 days versus eight months. 90 days, eight months. Think about the numbers. Okay. So I don't have to graduate from high school to look at those numbers. 90 days, that immunity from just being infected, right? Versus eight months if I had had the vaccine. So that's what I want people in the community to remember. If I was infected with COVID, 90 days is going to protect you if you think that you can be protected from COVID. After 90 days, it can come find you again. I'm going to keep it real for you. 90 days, it's going to hunt you down again. Where if you had the vaccine, we're going to protect you for maybe six to eight months. Six to eight months. Now, what, what's your choice? 90 days or six to eight months? And, and I think the other thing I'll add on to what, what, what Dr. Gibson said, because she's exactly right. You know, what we're seeing is that if you get immunity from natural disease, it tends to, to wane sooner. Mm -hmm. But I think the other two things that we're seeing is that people that maybe had infection with, with alpha, which was the variant that we the were seeing variant, most commonly, yeah. it's not that immunity that they developed from alpha is not covering them with delta. No. Whereas the vaccines were engineered to be able to be active against multiple variants and to this point are showing good efficacy. The last thing I'll say, and this is sort of a, say a personal story, it's a personal story of, of, of one of my team members. His parents both had COVID at the same time, probably caught it from the same, same source. And because they're in healthcare, they ended up having their antibodies pulled after they both were sick with COVID. Dad had antibodies that were very strong. Mom showed no antibodies at all. And so the other thing with natural immunity is it can be very different in every individual and depending on how serious your infection was, whereas the vaccines are developed to give a consistent, a, a consistent amount of immunity mm -hmm. in every single person that gets it. So I think that's another piece is that you know, you're sort of taking a risk. Did you really get that immunity from active disease or not? And that's why the vaccine is just much more reliable from that standpoint. Galen, this is uh, Gil Bland. Um, mm -hmm. As a uh, person who had a, a, a very severe infection, uh, I had the uh, question um, posed to me, and frankly, I posed the question, did I need to have vaccinations? And uh, the answer, in my opinion, was absolutely yes. And uh, I had my vaccination and in 21 days, uh, you know, had the second and uh, at the appropriate time, uh, we'll also seek the booster shot. Right. And, 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 the other, and, and the other thing is that, you know, in our community, just like I, I, I broke it down in the way that it was simple to understand, that's what we have to do in our community. And in our community, if you don't understand something, Stop and say, I don't understand. But many times in our community, we will say, I understand. I got it. But if you don't have it, and if you're sitting there with your mom or your dad, say, I don't understand. Explain that to me. Break it down. Because that can be the difference between life and death. You know, one, of, one of the challenges, I, I believe, is that, you know, there's not a tangible um, touch point. Uh, if anyone, uh, for example, I, I was in the hospital in January and it was a peak. And I was laying there in the ICU listening to TV saying that, you know, new records are being set daily, 4,000 plus deaths uh, daily uh, in the United States. And, you know, if, if 
someone could be uh, allowed into the hospital and see beds and hallways and uh, people like myself in the ICU completely helpless. And I'd never been hospitalized in my life, completely healthy, no comorbidities, nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, I was on the verge of, uh, of not making it. Uh, if you could see that, I think it would erase a lot of these issues because it's, it's, it's simply devastating. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question. I believe more women are concerned about preconception. Are there any reports of the vaccine throwing off the menstrual cycle? wants to take that. Yeah, so I mean, I'll start and, and Dr. Gibson, feel free to chime in. You know, there have been a few reports of individuals um, stating that their menstrual cycle may have been somewhat irregular immediate or after the vaccine. Those were self-reported through the um, self-reporting portal. Um, I don't have the exact numbers. It was a fairly low volume compared to the number of vaccines that have been administered. But I think what we don't know is, is that going to really impact fertility? Like I said you know, earlier, based on the information that the Centers for Disease Control reviewed earlier this week, it does not appear so. Um, but yes, there have been some reports, and we certainly want to give the truth of what we know. Uh, there have been some reports of uh, women reporting that they may have missed a menstrual cycle, for example, uh, at some point after getting the vaccine, uh, but it's not been determined that that's impacting fertility at this point. And, and, and again, um, when people receive their vaccine, um, they're given a, a QR code um, and that's to call in um, for, I think it's like up to four weeks after you receive your vaccine. Um, many people don't respond um, to the email um, that they receive because they feel it's bothersome. Um, and especially probably the young people that receive the email um, that comes to their phone. Um, but that email is important because they're collecting data um, that tells them, have you had any issues after receiving your vaccine? So the message um, to young people who may be listening to this Facebook Live, when you receive that text message that comes from I believe it comes from the CDC, please respond. Um, and they will ask you questions. Have you had any issues post vaccine? Because that will be the only way that we can say you've had no issues post vaccine so that we know there's no issues with fertility. Please answer um, the text message. Thank you. If we get vaccinated, can we still pass the virus to others? Cindy? Yeah, so, you know, if you do end up getting a breakthrough infection, even if you're vaccinated, you can spread the, 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 uh, the, the disease. Um, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, we recommend that, especially around uh, in close quarters, you know, if you're inside, especially, and you can't appropriately social distance, that you do wear a mask. Um, you know, that recommendation came from the CDC. I think one of the challenging things, and you know, again, more from the science side and listening to a lot of scientists over the last couple of days, is that COVID is, is a disease because it's, you know, it's a, the same family as a common cold would be. Um, and so it really, it's transmitted through, you know, through droplets and through the nose and whatnot. And while the vaccine does a very good job at preventing serious illness, hospitalization and death, it will not kill everything that you're carrying in your nose. And so if you've got active disease, there is the chance, even if you're vaccinated, that you may spread that disease. Although they do have found that if you're vaccinated, you've got less virus um, in your nasal passages than if you're not vaccinated. So that's hence the, the recommendation in certain situations to still consider masking up. Great, thank you. If you are fully vaccinated and wearing an N95 mask, is it safe to travel on a train while being in a high risk group? I mean, I don't know, Dr. Gibson. I mean, I would say, and I'll, I'll turf it over to Dr. Gibson. If you're duly vaccinated and you are wearing a mask, you are taking the precautions that the CDC 
has found to, 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 to protect you to the greatest extent possible. If you remember the slide that I showed earlier, the only thing missing there is appropriate hand hygiene, right? So vaccination is really probably the most important thing that you can do to protect yourself. And right behind that is appropriate masking. So you've gotten two out of the three and then making sure that you're doing appropriate hand hygiene um, really will give you that protection that you need. I mean, quite honestly, when you think about it, those of us in healthcare, those of us in healthcare taking care of people with active COVID every day, our protection is being vaccinated and wearing an N95 mask. Great, thank you. So I'm due any day and I want the vaccine before my son is born. How long will it take for the vaccine to take effect in my system? Is that Dr. Gibson? I, I'm going to turn that actually to Cindy because okay. I'm going to I'm going to give that to Cindy. Yeah. So 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 after the first dose, you will start seeing some effect of the vaccine in roughly ten days, but you're considered to be fully vaccinated. If you receive the Moderna or the Pfizer two dose series, you're considered to be fully vaccinated 14 days after the second dose. If it's Johnson and Johnson, it's 14 days after that dose. So that's when you hit your maximum uh, effectiveness. You'll start seeing some immediately, but it's really two weeks after that second dose for Pfizer and Moderna. Great, thank you. And the last question. I take a lot of vitamins, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C. Will these vitamins prevent me from getting COVID? You want to take that? <laughs> vitamins will, 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 depending on what your, your, your dietary needs are, vitamins may put you in a healthier state. Uh, there is some thought that vitamin D, if you're vitamin D deficient, that you might uh, be more at risk for COVID, but simply taking vitamins and not doing the other precautions such as getting vaccinated, wearing masks, social distancing, washing your hands, vaccines alone will not protect you from getting COVID. Great, thank you. I'm gonna pass it over to Toya in one second, but I wanna say thank you for allowing me to moderate this, this wonderful um, webinar. I hope everyone learns a lot. This is a public, health crisis, a community public health crisis. And that's the way you have to look at it. It's not only about you, it's about the people around you, your family, your friends, your community. This is our responsibility to make sure we get vaccinated to save our community. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Toya Sosa, Chief Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Officer for Riverside. Good evening. I hope you all can hear me well. Riverside's mission is to care for others as we would care for those that we love. And this includes the care that we extend to our team members, our patients, and the community. Our goal is to help improve public health, which is why it's important that we provide access to medical data and research so that individuals can make informed decisions about their health and the health of their loved ones. We partnered with the Urban League of Hampton Roads so that we could reach communities of color who are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. According to the CDC September 9th, 2021 report, Black people are 2.8 times more likely to be hospitalized and two times more likely to die from COVID-19 compared to their white counterparts. Latinos are 2.8 times more likely to be hospitalized and 2.3 times more likely to die from COVID-19 compared to their white counterparts. And American Indian and Alaskan natives are 3.5 times more likely to be hospitalized and 2.4 times more likely to die from COVID-19 compared to their white counterparts. Now with these odds, like, like what I just mentioned, it's critical to educate the public about the devastating effects that COVID-19 can have on unvaccinated individuals, especially people of color. Regardless of your decision tonight to get the vaccine, 
We hope that this webinar has provided an opportunity for you to separate the myths from the facts, as Dr. Gibson clearly stated to us about COVID-19. We want to leave you with this website, uh, in addition to the one that Dr. Gibson gave, to help you stay informed. You can go to riversideonline.com slash COVID-19. Again, that's riversideonline.com slash COVID-19. I want to thank all of our panelists tonight, Cindy Williams, VP of Pharmacy at Riverside, Gil Bland, President of the Urban League, who graciously told us his story tonight, very compelling story. Gaylene Kenoyton with Celebrate Healthcare and fellow board member of the Urban League of Hampton Roads. Dr. Ethelyn Gibson from Hampton University, thank you so much. We enjoyed your candid uh, comments and discussion with Cindy tonight and the other panelists. And lastly, I wanna thank uh, those that are behind the scenes and helping us tonight, our marketing team at Riverside, um, including April Weston and Letitia James with the Urban League of Hampton Roads, who was very instrumental in helping us plan this panel discussion tonight. Thank you to all of you who tuned in, and we especially thank you for your participation and great questions tonight. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>